Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the Art Table again today. Today we're continuing the Columbia Lore video series and looking at the last major battle in the Lakeshire War. Now, I'm going to put all of the Columbia Lore videos together in a playlist, which should be linked down in the description below. So if you want to know more about the Lakeshire War, you can go and watch the videos in that playlist on this topic. Hopefully, at some point soon, there will be more there than just the Lakeshire War videos. But as of this recording, that's all that's going to be in there right now. In the meantime, let's talk about the Battle of Five Ridges. As I mentioned at the end of the campaign's video, during the winter and spring of 863, Lakeshire spent a great deal of time fortifying a very defensible strategic position about 22 miles south of Palmyra, Lakeshire's capital. To assist them in this endeavor, the assistant master of the Knights of the Stone Circle accepted a commission as a major general in the Lakeshire Militia. Sir Hezekiah Oldfathers then assumed command of the 1st Druidic Division and went south with the rest of the militia. Oldfathers and his forces were to set up a number of arcane defenses across the ridges and then position themselves as a reserve, reinforcing the rest of the militia as needed. Lakeshire's strategy was to seek a decisive battle. In other words, inflicting such heavy losses upon the Colombian regulars in a single encounter that the government in Hancock would be persuaded to sue for peace. The problem with decisive battle as a strategy is it doesn't really work. I mean, militarily, it often works to win a decisive battle, but rarely does that ever translate into the kind of diplomatic gains you would hope it would. It's a very extreme long shot, but that's all Lakeshire really had at the time. So General Oldfathers went and he joined General Cooper. Now, the ridges in question, which you can see on the screen, were a series of rocky formations left behind by glaciers over the years. These stone heights were separated by gullies filled with gravel and loose sand, along with the occasional short grass or scrub brush. It wasn't really a good place for plants to grow, so there was little chance that the Lakeshire troops could be taken by surprise. At the base of the ridges was a wide open plain full of a number of large standing rocks, again filled with loose gravel, small shrubs, and the occasional tree. This particular stretch of land had never really been important before, so no one really had any names for what was around them. General Cooper set up his headquarters on the westernmost ridge, which is how it got its name. The other four were just called whatever the soldiers could remember. Old Fathers and the Druids set up camp, under the eaves of the nearby forest, about three, four hundred feet back from the main lines. They were there for nearly ten weeks, digging in, setting traps, and getting familiar with the territory, before the main body of Colombian troops arrived under the command of Lieutenant General Scott Taylor Walters. Now, Walters was no man's fool. He could see that he was in a very dangerous spot. But Cooper and Old Fathers had chosen their location very carefully. It was, in fact, the easiest part of the lines to break through without having to circle very far around Lakeshire County to the west, something that would have demanded a great deal of time and brought Walter's forces close enough to the northern border that the Sana could conceivably interpret it as an act of war. So Walter's made camp at the base of the Five Ridges in the shadow of the rubble and debris that his troops called the Stones. Colombian sappers spent several days combing through the stones, attempting to remove any kind of traps, scrying spells, and ensorcelled plants that the druids might be using to survey or sabotage them. There was some light skirmishing between scouting parties over this time, but for the most part, it was quiet. Finally, after four days of preparatory work, six Colombian regiments made their way around the east side of the stones and into the teeth of the Lakeshire Formation. Two regiments each approached Harvest Watch Ridge and Pinecrest Ridge with the intention of holding the bodies of troops there, in place. The remaining two regiments intended to try and slip through between the two ridges and hopefully outflank the troops on Pinecrest Ridge. With a breach in the line thus effected, the plan was to continue flanking around the east side and sweep up Harvest Watch Ridge as well. Basically none of this went as planned. The assault on Harvest Watch Ridge was repelled, but the troops fell back in good order. That was pretty much what they expected after all. The troops attempting to slip between Harvest Watch and Pinecrest were likewise cut off. Several companies from both Pinecrest and Harvest Watch were able to reposition and cut off the attacking regiments with no real difficulty. 
The biggest surprise came on Pinecrest Ridge. On Pinecrest Ridge, which the Colombians referred to as the Funnel, the defending regiment was the 1st Lakeshire Zoo Aves, an experimental unit armed with a new kind of sulfurite weapon designed to strike at a much longer range than the typical sword or spear. Given the shape of the ridge line, General Cooper believed that the Zoo Aves could hold off far more troops than a conventional unit could by virtue of their superior range of attack. And for a brief period of time, this proved to be true. However, the glaives they were issued were not very efficient, and they ran through their store of fire very quickly. In less than an hour, they went from having the longest range of anyone on the battlefield to no range at all. This allowed the attacking Colombians to get very, very far up the ridge much faster than anyone expected them to. For a moment, it looked like the Colombians would make a breach in the line where absolutely no one was expecting them to. However, sulfurite weaponry is both a long-range weapon and a melee weapon, and Lakeshire Zooaves made a stand at the tip of the funnel. After an hour and a half of fierce fighting, the Zooaves were pretty much whittled down, but somehow the Colombian regulars were not able to effect a true breach in the lines in spite of another two hours of work. If the legends from the 18th and 42nd Infantry Regiments are to be believed, that was thanks to the efforts of a single Lakeshire trooper, who held the ridge against all comers, in a display of martial prowess the likes of which few living have ever seen. He couldn't turn back the Colombian troops, but he managed to hold the line long enough that several companies from the nearby regiment on the ridge came to back him up. Walters, sensing weakness, dispatched three fresh regiments around the west side of the stones up towards the junction between Slate Top Ridge and Pinecrest Ridge. Because the inclination was rather steep, these regiments were forced to march a switchback pattern, and getting up to their target ridge took them much longer than walking in a straight line. The new offensive, combined with the weakness in the eastern half of the lines, convinced Old Fathers it was time to commit part of his troops. He dispatched his eastern regiment to reinforce Pinecrest and Harvest Watch. Old Fathers himself, woke part of the forest, and marched over 200 trees down to Slate Top Ridge. Already badly harried by the curses and distractions that the Druids had set up in advance, the regiments at Slate Top completely broke under the assault. In truth, there was very little they could have done against such a mass of Greenwood, turned against them by the arcane might of one of the most powerful Druids in the nation. The renewed offensive turned back, leaving over a quarter of their number on the slopes. The forces in the east didn't really fare much better. No one druid sent against them was as powerful as Old Fathers, but there were a lot more of them. When combined with the surviving militia, it was child's play to break the regiments and send them back down the hill. That was pretty much the end of the first day's fighting. However, the repelled Colombians didn't go all the way back to camp. They stopped just in front of the stones and reformed, digging a series of defensive trenches that they expanded forward in a zigzag pattern. Scott Taylor Walters was no stranger to long grinding battles. His troops knew their work and they went about it with a will. Over the next five days it seemed that things had pretty much settled down. The Colombians dug trenches, the Lakeshire people tried to rouse them out of them. Neither side had a whole lot of success. However, Walters was a canny commander. He knew part of what made the five ridges so defensible was the terrain. It was a little too rough too rocky, too uneven to effectively deploy horse cavalry. However, Walters had done several tours of duty on the southern border with Tetzlan. There, the northern mountains produced a species of very large and hardy lizard, suitable for riding and capable of climbing up rocky surfaces where many hooved animals were not. Walters had requisitioned a few companies of these so-called scale cavalry early that spring, and now he finally had them on hand. Once his troops had his entrenching done to a point where he thought it was sufficient, Walters brought his scale cavalry to the western flank under cover of darkness. The next day he renewed his infantry attacks at their previous locations. While the scale cavalry rushed around the western flank, driving between Cooper and Ivy Heart ridges. With the cavalry hitting Slate Top Ridge from behind, and immense stress on the eastern flank, Old Fathers and his remaining reserves had too many different things to watch to effectively counter them all. By the end of the tenth day of the Battle of Five Ridges, Slate Top Ridge was in Colombian hands. 
From there, it was a simple matter of concentrating troops on Slate Top Ridge until there were enough to sweep the other ridges clear. The surviving troops were pushed north to Palmyra, where, three weeks later, Walters forced the government to surrender, officially bringing the war to a conclusion. But that's not quite the end of the story. There's one last epitaph to the Battle of Five Ridges, but we'll talk about that next week. In the meantime, let me know what you think down in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. You can use those as you see fit, and I'll talk to you later.